Hey everybody, welcome to the Sheepdog Project. Doc with you as always, and across from me is Tim Kennedy. Ho ho! I'm, I'm uh, filling up my water bottle. filling up his water bottle. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Gotta stay hydrated, people. Mm -hmm. So what's up with this rental truck you drove over here in? What's up with that? Um, I got an, an amazing, beautiful <laughs> Ford King Ranch Platinum. And uh, the... <sighs> I needed to do the, kind of the, the regular 6,000 mile maintenance mm -hmm. on it. And um, the dealership gave me a car to use while they did my 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 maintenance. And um, and I'm just wrecking their rental. So they gave you an actual truck. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a rental truck, like pickup truck. When you're Tim Kennedy. When you're Tim Kennedy. You get a rental truck. I guess it's possible. It's, yeah. They probably have a rental Lambo was, for you. I was like, can I have uh, the same truck that you guys are working on? They're like, Sir, we don't carry that truck. It's too it's nice. Too special. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, have you? So let's talk about vehicles. Have you? Uh, have you always been a truck guy? No, I've been a, a very economically driven driver. So my my cars were notoriously or infamously not cheap, but you know they got forty miles a gallon. Mm -hmm. They are manual transmission. Mm -hmm. They are very very meticulously kept up uh but the, the my normal car that i would drive would be very commuter-esque mm -hmm. one thing that uh when you get to know tim you get to know this about tim and uh those of you who have seen us on the history channel know that tim always drives and tim is very it, tim in some way in that way he's just the opposite of me because i hate to drive so i'm always happy when i'm working with tim for many reasons but one of the reasons is because tim always wants to drive tim always insists on driving which mm -hmm. is great so uh what do you look for in a vehicle what's what's like I important to you the i want a car that will do what i want it to mm -hmm. um we're, we're in this really weird era we, we had that bmw um in birch's garden it was like the Porsche, the BMW's competitor for the Porsche mm -hmm. SUV. SUV, yeah. Um, it was like the X7 or the X9. It was a $100,000 SUV. And that car would interrupt me when I'm trying to do things. I would have to put it on sports mode and lock it in sports mode so that when I'm doing my annual transmission or um, I'm uh, ha keeping it at a higher RPM, because uh, sometimes people don't like what we're doing and they chase us or they want us to leave quickly or I want to get away before they know I'm there and all these other things that you have to have a vehicle can do it. So what, what I look for in a vehicle is that it's going to do what I want it to when I want it to. So it's going to be meticulously maintained. It's going to have good tires. It's going to be properly um, serviced. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the oil has been changed. The engine has been well kept. It's not too many miles, but it's not too few miles where it could get uh, the brand new baby bumps or it's not so worn that it's going to quit on me. Um, I want a vehicle that doesn't stand out. I want a vehicle that kind of looks like all the other vehicles around it, but That's important can perform better than everybody around me you know you illustrated a really important point with modern and i have a i have a lot of issues with modern vehicles because i like you grew up maintaining my own vehicles and it was a lot easier back then they, there was the, all this computerized stuff and i can work on carburetors all day long i can't do anything with a fuel injector um it's become it's a lot you know when, when the zombie apocalypse comes we're I'm screwed. Gonna, I, well, I'm going to be looking for a you know a 1968 El Camino because yeah. I can I know I can maintain that. Um, the the stuff that's out there now it's a lot harder. And also, you talked about how Tim specifically talked about how the car would interrupt what he wanted to do because these cars have these computer systems in it now, and it reminds me a lot of when jet fighters went to what they call the fly by wire, and they had these onboard computers. I, I want to say it was even Chuck Yeager that said it. It was, it was somebody famous said, yeah, the great thing about the, or, or not the great thing. He said, the thing about these new aircraft is they make marginal pilots into really good pilots because of what they do. They anticipate, no, you didn't want to do that. You didn't want to do that. That'll drive you into the ground. So I'm going to make that correction for you. He said, 
they make marginal pilots really good pilots, but they also make great pilots really good pilots because they will affect you at the upper end as well if you're trying to really push that aircraft to the envelope. And the same is true with a lot of these vehicles. And the first time I was ever exposed to this, is actually something that's pretty old, is uh, when you think about um, posi traction, how if you high side on one side or another with, with, a, with a posi track and an automatic transmission, you're going to be spinning one wheel up in the air and not going anywhere. And, there is a, and, I, and I learned when I took a tactical driving course, hey, guess what? There's a way to override that, and this is how you do it. Yeah. And you have to know things like that. And uh, vehicles will, either because they're unable to perform or because they think through their computer you're unable to perform, they'll say, no, you don't want to do that. You want to do this. And like you said, you kept having to put it back into sport mode. And it, it worries me a little bit. You know, when we talk about all the things that we want to be able to do with a vehicle, uh, not only in the zombie apocalypse, which would be awesome, but on, but on a day-to-day -day basis, and it, it really does, in a lot of ways, makes it harder. You know, with the for a vehicle to interrupt what I want it to do, um, it thinks that I'm doing something unsafe or not ideal for the vehicle. Uh, those things that we're doing, we have gone to schools for, right? I. I, I know how to shift the weight of the vehicle in a specific direction when I'm going around a turn so I can go around that turn faster. Or if it is such a hard turn and I want to have enough acceleration coming out of it where I might even slide into the turn mm -hmm. so that I can have a perfect position for me to go up and out of that turn instead of accelerating as I come out, mm -hmm. I'm accelerating through the turn, mm -hmm. um, drifting into it. Like These are all different skill sets about how you're going to drive. Vehicles right now don't want you to do any of those things, mm -hmm. but you first have to know how to do those things. Like those are skills of how to do a J turn, mm -hmm. um, how to pit a vehicle, how to counter pit a vehicle, how to ram a vehicle. Like I promise when I get in my truck, so um, our business partner, Blake Hayes, his brother owns a, a, a dealership called Patriot Motor Cars. Look him up. Oh, you really should. Yeah, so every awesome. time that they sell a car, they donate to the Sheepdog Survival Fund. And um, so I told them, I want a car that kind of looks, I said, we're in Texas, right? I'm in mm -hmm. central Texas. Everybody drives a King Ranch truck. Right. And um, so I want, I want a truck that looks like everybody else, but I want the biggest motor. I want the sports package with the sports suspension, with the, po the, with the sports um, transmission. Mm -hmm. I, want the I want the four wheel. I want everything so that when I tell it to do something, it is going to do it, and it's going to do it faster than everybody else. But I know how to do it. I, have, I, I, I can't tell you how many different driving schools I've been to. If I get behind the wheel of my vehicle or a vehicle that I am familiar and understand its capability of, aside from completely either killing me or destroying the vehicle's ability to move, as in blowing up the motor, you can't stop me. There's nothing I can do. If you, if, 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 thank God there's not a Tim Kennedy or a Mike Simpson on London Bridge behind a vehicle that they know how to drive, because it's not going to be 16 people. It's going to be every person on that bridge. Yeah, absolutely. And, th and that is, I mean, this, what we're talking about here is a skill set, a skill set that is commonly neglected. Um, every night, and every day, a police officer gets behind the wheel of, the, of his patrol car. A firefighter gets behind his, his the engineer gets behind the truck's um, steering wheel. A the police officer typically spends 80% of his career time behind the wheel. Behind the wheel. Cruiser. It's, and the skill of positioning the vehicle, um, a lot of people aren't allowed to pit anymore, which is moronic. Everybody, it is one of the greatest tools, um, know, knowing how to get a car, to, to be able to disable a car without hurting anybody, and that's what pitting is. Yeah, if you don't know what pitting is, uh, and you can look at, there's some great YouTube videos that illustrate it, but it, basically it's a way for a pursuing vehicle to cause the vehicle that they are after to move off the road and be stopped in a safe fashion. Yeah, you, you, you disable it, you make it lose traction, and the vehicle does a 180 and then stops. Yeah. And basically what you're doing is you're using your own forward speed, the heaviest portion of your car, against and the lightest, against portion, the lightest of portion of their car, and physics actually does 90% of the work yeah. for you. No damage. 
if you do it correctly, I, I, I can pick cars without trading paint. Like I can do it so softly, like there's not any damage to a vehicle or I can be real rough, you know, but because I've pitted 2000 times. And if you try to pit me, we end up in, not only can you not pit me, but if you pit me, I end up in a pitting position on your vehicle while we're still moving forward. So like these are skills, skills that you have to practice. It's vehicular jujitsu. It, really. it really <laughs> is. You know, we have these EVOC courses, emergency vehicle operation courses, and the firefighters, they have to go to different versions of it. Um, if you're executive protection, you know, if you're a PT, PSD detail, you're supposed to be able to do a J-turn in a bus or in a limo or in an SUV, or, you know, if you're driving for secret service and you have the president in the back, or you're driving for the state department you have hillary clinton in the back there's all these skills that you're supposed to have and that and the only way that you get them is just like with shooting just like with fighting you have to practice them and you have to drill them and you have to perfect them and driving is one of those things that is in in my opinion neglected massively dangerously neglected we, we're a, we're a mobile society we, uh, we, that's, and that's part of the reason, you know, you go to any major city and you look at how jammed up the expressways are, I'm making air quotes, and it's because uh, we're an incredibly mobile society. We've made access to wheeled vehicles uh, easier. It's, you know, it, at all levels of, of the economic spectrum in this country, people own their own vehicles. And we spend a lot of time in them going back and forth. And you're absolutely right, Tim. People don't know, you know, you people prepare, you know, the, the type of people that listen to this podcast, the type of people that come to our courses, they might prepare for what they have to do in the way of armed and unarmed lethality. But how many of them prepare for, you know, four vans pull up with, you know, some Pakistanis in them and decide that, you know, you're their target and they want to run you off the road or the Sinaloa cartel or whoever it might be. And people don't train for that. And that's, uh, that's something we're going to be remedying, yeah. but there's not a lot of schools. There are schools out there, but not a lot of people know about them. I mean, guys like you and I do, cause we've both been in units where we get to go to schools like that. Um, most people just don't know about them. And it's, and it's a, it, think of that whole segment of your day think think right now about how much you spend in your vehicle going to and from and think about how vulnerable you are to all the other vehicles what do you what do you say to those people I mean, for, at first you illustrate a great point which is tim owns the most nondescript truck for central texas if he lived in new york city god forbid or downtown los angeles that's not the vehicle that he would own so it really it starts with that and both my prior vehicles were so nondescript from where I was coming from, they look like everybody else. Like this isn't something that has been recently added to Tim's arsenal and tool belt. Like my last two vehicles looked like everybody else. Yeah. When I lived in California, I looked like I belonged in California. Tim's sedan is so nondescript that he has gotten places before me and his car is there and I'm texting him, asking him how far out he is because I don't even realize he's there because I forget what his car looks like. And now this truck, you're like, where'd he go? So where we are sitting at this exact moment, no further than two miles away, just a couple of years ago, uh, I can't sell, say who the person was. Um, there was a PSD detail, uh, a bodyguard unit that was attached and assigned to a very high worth family. Mm -hmm. That family was going over an overpass two miles from where we are. Mm -hmm. And they had a vehicle interdiction. Somebody stopped perpendicular mm -hmm. on the overpass. There was no, and then there was a vehicle behind them. Thank God the, the bad guys didn't know that the good, good guys had a trail vehicle. Mm -hmm. So trail vehicle comes up, rams the rear blocking vehicle, exactly how you're supposed to ram, taking the heaviest part of your car against the lightest portion of their car, spinning it out of the way, and then ramming it up against the wall, creating a, cling, a clear exit for the principal, for the people that you're protecting. Principal vehicle puts it in reverse, J turns, goes the opposite direction of traffic, back onto the freeway, new exit. Two miles from where we're sitting, just a couple of years ago, uh, a fellow, a fellow Austinite, they were either trying to kidnap or kill them for a, for a purpose. Gunfight happens right then and there. Never even hears it, hear about it on the news. Mm -hmm. That happened here in Austin, Texas. I'm not talking 
Juarez. I'm not talking El Paso. I'm not talking Baghdad. I'm not talking Mogadishu. I'm talking Austin, Texas. These are skills that you have to have. When we were in Chile together last year, mm-hmm. We, we were in a passive aggressive pursuit. Mm-hmm. There were people that were tailing us yep. and we were trying Photographing to Photographing us. Yep. And we were trying us. to break them. And it took us how many stoplights? Uh three. Three. Yep. They're gone. We we, <laughs> identi- we identified gone. them probably within two or three minutes of them getting on us. And three stoplights later, yeah. they're lost. And the, the, the conversation in the vehicle, what was really funny was the conversation in the vehicle, and we were mic'd up because we were shooting. So everybody in the crew heard this. And the conversation between Tim and I was, hey, do you? Yep. And that was it. That was the entire conversation. And then and then three traffic lights later, it was, all right, we're good. <laughs> but those are skills. You know, first, there was a level of awareness by both you and I. You and I are separate vehicles, both of us situationally aware, and we're turned on. Our mm-hmm. essay is ready to go. Yeah. Quickly identified a threat. And that's what it is. You know, like a, a, a vehicle tailing us, um, I don't care if they're trying to photograph us or they're going to shoot us. If doesn't matter. I don't care. I'm 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 dictating how things are going. I'm not playing by their rules. We're playing by ours. So within minutes we identify them, and within minutes after that we have broken and they're, and they're and we've lost them. This is the ideas of being a sheepdog really put to the test. You know, there there's a skill set there of the level of awareness that was ready. There's a a technical ability and skill set that was there for us to be able to use counterintelligence and then counter driving to get away from them and so they couldn't follow us and at speeds that they couldn't even follow us through lights that they would that we broke the law and they couldn't without getting broadsided get through if you're traveling overseas if you're if you're in London, if you're in Paris, if you are in North Africa, if you're going to Casablanca, you're going to have to take your wife and go get some tangier, some couscous, and, <laughs> and then watch some belly dancers or like, awesome. Well, this is a skill you need to have. Yeah. And your ability to drive, the reason I always want to drive is because you can't stop me unless I want to stop. You will have to kill me to get my vehicle to stop. You can't pit me. You can't ram me. You, aside from killing me or disabling my vehicle, I'm going to go where I want to go. And that gives us freedom of movement. Freedom of movement with mobility, with guys like us, where a skill set that is a very frightening thing. No, ex- extremely important. And I know a lot of you, some of you are probably listening to this podcast right now in your vehicle. And that's, again, that's a big problem. There's a, a really popular commercial that I keep seeing on TV uh, right now where the guy is in his vehicle and he's uh, singing Tom Jones. And most people, when they're in their vehicles, they're in that bubble. And you got to get out of that bubble, people. Uh, You need to be aware of the things that are around you. Because if somebody knows they can't get into your house, if somebody knows they can't come into your place of business because you're a sheepdog and you're prepared for that, well, they're going to try to get you out on the road. And the advantage of them getting you out of the road too is th- there's, a, there's a saying about, uh, about an ambush that I heard a long time ago, I believe it was when I was in ranger school, is the great thing about an, the ambush is the bad guy gets to pick where it goes down. You don't get to pick where it goes down. So they get to pick, you know, they know what your routes are. They're going to pick the best place to do it, and they know you're going to be alone. You're not going to have backup. It's not like when you're in your house and you have other family members and a long gun. It's not like when you're in work, where you know every you know you know for example you know you know Tim and Blake and I are and and Shane and I are all at work somewhere, and everybody's carrying a gun. You know they're going to single one of us out for when they're in their vehicle, at that point in that blind curve or whatever it might be. You know if you think about uh, the movie Ronan. Uh, with with De Niro, you know you're gonna you're gonna pick that ideal spot and you're gonna you're gonna execute it, and that's what you have to be prepared for. I think more than anything else. What do you what do you, you know route selection? So you know that's that, right there. Yeah, yeah. So for for I mean Ronan's a great example. The movie Bullet, um, great pursuit. But for Ronan, they were laying on an ambush, and they were able to plan that ambush because they knew the route. Mm-hmm. So route selection is the first and most important thing when it comes to movement. When we're looking at how I'm going to move, whether it's my unit my family when I'm on vacation, uh, I straight up do route planning. I look at multiple options about how to get somewhere, how to go somewhere, the, not only the fastest, but the most dangerous. And 
in each of those respective routes what the most dangerous course of action is, the most likely course of action. I realize if I'm going through downtown Buenos Aires, I'm going to have people walking up to my car and trying to clean the windows. Uh, but I realize that if I go out into the streets I have a or out into like the suburbs or up into the mountains a little bit, I have a better chance of being um, carjacked. I have a better chance of people seeing a nice vehicle and, and coming up and trying to find out why I'm there because I obviously don't belong. So there's, there's, there's risks and rewards with every route, but you have to think through them. So route selection is, is vital. You know, it's paramount in success and mobility. That's before you even get to skills or vehicle selection. Like just how am I going to get from point A to point B without anything happening? Let's say you are a person that uh, that does your route selection and varies your route, you know, to and to and from uh, to kind of break up your routine. And some of you are thinking, yeah, I already, Mike, Tim, I already got this down. I already do that. I already vary my route. Well, think about where you live, and think about where you work. If I'm going to get to my house, there are, you know, I can vary my route all day long if I'm going from Tim's house to my house, but there are a couple of places where I'm going to have to commit at the very end. There are choke points that I'm either going to have to come in on this street or I'm either going to have to come in on this street. It's the same if you're going to work. You know, there's an interchange somewhere that you're just, no matter how much you varied your route, maybe you took an hour to drive 15 minutes, there is a point where you're going to have to go through this choke point. That's coming in, that's going out. It's That's important for you to know for a couple of reasons. Number one if that's a place that also happens to coincide with uh, ground that is tactically of benefit to them, that could be the place that they choose to take you out. Especially if, it's, let's say, it's a traffic light with the window washers, like Tim talked about, where you're already jammed up. All they got to do is have a car behind you that just bumps you. You get out to go, hey, man, what's going on? And boom, they've taken you down. That's also, these, are, these choke points are also the locations where you're going to pick up a tail. Those are the locations as you come out of your housing complex or the parking lot at work to get onto the main thoroughfare. The bad guys know that that's the place you have to cross every day. That's your line of departure. That's where they're going to have somebody set up to say he's going north, he's going south, he's going east, he's going west, whatever it might be. That's going to be the point that you pick up that tail. So those are things to think about. And you need to have all of your switches in the on position as you, because you can't eliminate those. You know, you can't teleport back and forth. You're going to have to confront these choke points. So that's the area that you need to be completely switched on. You need to have the podcast turned all the way down or off. You need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to be aware, is, has that car been behind me the whole way? Or is it, is, did it just pull in behind me? Who's that guy standing on the corner? That's a different homeless guy than I normally see there. What's going on? So you need to be aware of that. Man, if you're like, oh, seriously, Mike, Tim, like, I'm not going to be a victim. You know, this is, that's not true. You know, if you're, if you're a first responder in any way, shape, or form, you're being targeted these days. If you have a Make America Great sticker on the back of your car, Mm -hmm. you're going to be targeted. If you have a NRA lifetime member Yeti sticker with um, a LaRue, um, God bless our military, especially our sniper sticker, Mm -hmm. you're going to be targeted. And when you're overseas, you're traveling I hate to say it no better. Even even if you listen to our episode and you did everything that we told you to, you're still going to be targeted. The rent a car is the rent a car. If you're in yeah, a there's, car. An, yeah, there's I'll, no two ways around it. It takes me like at a heartbeat to identify a rental car. And then I look at the person and I see, okay, is that person here for business? Is that per- person here for um, other reasons? Because there are other reasons that you get rental cars. Mm-hmm. You know, like your car is getting repaired. Uh, you don't want to use your actual vehicle. So I do, I use rental cars a lot, not only when I'm traveling, but also when I'm here, um, when I'm going to go do work for people, I don't want to show up at somebody's house with a car that they know my, they can track back to my, my business and my car, my license plate doesn't go back to my home. It goes back to my business. So like there are layers in, there's insulation of being able to like you take a photo of me getting out of my truck. Um, cool. You just now found my business address. Guess who's at my business? A bunch of dudes with guns. Like, you know, (laughs) sucks to be you. ISIS. Anytime. Still waiting. Still waiting. (laughs) Awkward silence. Still waiting. 
what what's your advice, Tim, to you know the the person out there who uh, maybe they don't have the means to get absolutely the most high performance vehicle that they can, and they don't have the access that guys like you and I had to those courses to to learn to drive other than the situational awareness which we've talked about and another reason the situational awareness is important i'm going to interject this real quick and then i'm going to kick it over to tim is uh, you know a lot of you are thinking well yeah i'm armed everywhere i go okay where's your weapon is it on your hip how hard with in the seat with the seat belt on with the console right there next to you how difficult is it is it to get that pistol out i know a lot of police officers who good for them carry two Yep. And one of them is, is mounted under the dash for exactly that reason. Because you see cops all the time, they have to, you know, they stop to do their paperwork, to do their call ins, whatever it is. And that's the time that they're going to get ambushed. So you need to know, you know, you don't want to find out in the heat of the moment if you can get to that weapon. But mm. what, what, what do you say to that? What do you say to those people, Tim? What, what do they do to well, make you, themselves? You have like eight, eight things I want to say all at the same time. I don't even want to start. Um, so. My, one of my old bosses, John Shrek McPhee, the sheriff of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't know who he is, look him up. He did a series of videos uh, about gunfighting out of a vehicle. And the first thing he did was like, put on his seatbelt. And you're like, wait a second, you're gonna, it's going to slow you to get out of the vehicle. Man, that seatbelt. So when I take my seatbelt, I actually loop it one time over and then I plug it in. So it locks me into my seat and I pull it tight and it's taunt up against me so that it's it's it secured me in front of the wheel. So even when I start doing really freaky stuff behind the behind the wheel, I'm going to still sit and be situated right in front of my pedals and right in front of my wheel, which is where I need to be. Second, when I am ha when I'm carrying my gun, um, I need my gun to be at a place that I can get to and that it will be after I do some really squirrely stuff. So if I ram a vehicle, if I pit a vehicle, if I get rammed, if I get somebody tries to pit me, um, that v if, if I just took my gun out and I put it in the center dash area, mm -hmm. it's gone. If I put oh, it yeah. up underneath my legs, when I slam on the brakes, that then gun is up behind the brake or up behind the accelerator. Um, if and I you definitely don't want it caught under the no. accelerator. If I stomp on the accelerator, <laughs> guess what? It just went underneath their seat, and now you got to get underneath your seat to get your gun out. So you need to have a place that it is secure. So I have a place up on my door when I take my concealed carry off of me. I actually have this little padded area that I built on my door that it clips into. So it's in my door, and, um, and I have my second gun in my center console. Uh, so like... Left hand, right hand, cross draw, cross draw. I got guns that are exactly where they're supposed to be and they're secure and they're affixed there. Mm -hmm. um, so your question, where do you start? Anywhere is better than where you are. Yeah. And there are driving schools, I would even say thousands of them that you can go to. No, you can't get behind a Humvee or an up-armored Suburban and learn how to J-turn it. But you don't you, need to. You don't need to. Yeah, that's not what you need. You can go to a regular basic driving school. Insurance programs will even pay for you to go for the, to those sometimes. If you're like if you're a motorcycle rider, you go to the basic motorcycle course. You can go to the intermediate basic, uh, motorcycle course, which is paid for by your insurance and you get a and you get a discount on your insurance if you go to it. They have the same courses for regular vehicles. You have like the um, level one basic driver course. Like in California, it's like required for my daughters um, to be going to school. Uh, it's like driver's ed, driver training. And then after that, they get they can go to like this intermediate advance where they, they learn um, higher risks, like traveling at higher speeds or what vehicles are going to be coming what. They learn how to recover from losing traction. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and you can keep, you can go just to a basic racing school. You can go to, um, you know, NASCAR puts them on all the time. Uh, here in Austin, there are five different, it's just here in Austin, there are five different driving schools. Mm -hmm. One of them does in go-karts. One of them does it like a, uh, um, the derby style where like you're drifting and slamming and bumping and grinding and changing paint. So um, there's, there's tons of opportunity everywhere you live. You just have to look into it a little bit. And, uh, and then you can also just get online and uh, start watching videos of 
all right, so I'm accelerating. I'm off the brake. I take the steering wheel from the three to the nine. Mm -hmm. Then I release it after I've lost traction and oh, my vehicle has recentered itself and is back on its course. But anywhere is better than where you are and just start. Yeah, no, really important. And for those that have asked or those that are thinking it now, is Sheepdog going to do a driving course? And that is something that we're in the planning stages for. So that we that's probably not too far off. No, not yeah. at all. Um, we, I can drive. You can drive. I have been to countless courses, but I am not a driver. I, I and just like all like when when you came on to Sheepdog, um, when we're bringing Colton Smith in, yeah. we we really want the best the subject matter expert and yeah. not not. Not a expert, the 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 expert. We want the best driver that's ever been behind the wheel and that is alive today and that can then convey that information to somebody else. And we have to have the right facility mm -hmm. to uh, give the students the opportunity to learn and apply that same information. And that's where we are right now. We, we have the intent, we have the desire, we have the curriculum, we, we know there's the need and the want, um, and we're putting together the perfect recipe for giving a course. Yeah. Could Tim Kennedy teach you this course tomorrow? Yes. But we, like everything we do in Sheepdog, we want it to be the absolute best. And for that reason, we're waiting until we have the absolute best people locked in, the absolute best facility, the absolute best resources. And then that is something that you'll see coming up from us anything else to add before we go man take care of your vehicle when was the last time that you went out and checked the the pressure in your tires yeah. um are you getting it serviced regularly when you go in and get it serviced and they're like hey you know you're due to insert that thing that they're trying to upcharge you for right. um there's a reason why you're due for that that doesn't necessarily mean you have to do it if they said hey you're supposed to change your air filter every thirty thousand miles um or whatever it is for that vehicle Take a look at your air, air filter. Do you even know where your air filter is? Um, be familiar with the capabilities of your vehicle and uh, its limitations and its assets. Knowing how fast can it go, does it have a governor? I know uh, when I drive my wife's car versus my car, we have different speeds in which it then kicks in to try to prevent us from going any faster. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Both Fords, both of them brand new, but both of them, different speeds. Mm -hmm. hmm. Important to know. Yeah. Know your vehicle. Yeah. Take care of it. It might save your life one day. All right, everybody. Great information today. I hope you digested some of that. Uh, keep hitting us up with all these great questions we've been getting on social media and via email. And since we talked about cars today, I'm going to leave you with a quote from the late, great Henry Ford, the father of American automotive industry. And he said, when everything seems to be going against you, remember that the airplane takes off against the wind, not with it. Remember that, everybody. And until next time, be a sheepdog. You have been listening to The Sheepdog Project. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash sheepdog response. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the individual and do not represent any larger entity, public or private.